I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Today's psalm is number 69, and in my Bible, it's titled, An Urgent Plea for Help in Times of Trouble. And it's another set of lyrics that are sent to David's chief musician. You know, David's only noted direction is that the lyrics be set to the tune of another psalm. In this case, it is the tune of the lilies. And we're left to wonder why David chose that particular melody. Perhaps the lyrics of Psalm 69 were a continuation of the theme of a previous psalm, uh, like, you know, a Star Wars sequel or something. Maybe David just liked that tune. But one thing that we will learn for certain through our study of Psalm 69 is that it would much rather have the son of David as an advocate than David the man. And what I mean is, is that <clears throat> I'd rather have Jesus as my advocate than have David. David was no stranger to unjust suffering. Twice in his lifetime, David's life was in jeopardy as he was pursued by the vast majority of his own nation, a nation that he was called to become the king of. They were supposed to be his servants, and yet they were seeking to kill him. <clears throat> Once was under Saul's reign, <clears throat> the other time was at the hand of David's own son, Absalom. Psalm 69 begins with David's urgent personal plea. How urgent? <clears throat> as urgent as a drowning man. And so let's begin in verse 1. Psalm 69 verse 1 says this. He says, To the chief musician set to the lilies a psalm of David, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Save me. In Hebrew, Hosheni. Now David is urgently pleading with God for immediate deliverance. Literally, he's saying, Hosheni, which is save me now. And if we can understand the life or death urgency of being saved from drowning, then we can better grasp the use of the same word, Hosanna, during Jesus' triumphal entry uh, before his crucifixion. Hosanna means save us now. Matthew 21 verses 9 through 11 says this, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, save us now, to the Son of David. Blessing is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all of the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude said, well, this is Jesus, whose name means God saves. So it makes sense. They're saying, save us now, as if they're calling out to the Lord, and yet they're looking at this man. And they said, who is this man? And in Hebrew, the understanding is, well, his name is God saves. He is the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Furthermore, knowing the urgency of salvation, we get a better understanding as to why the angel reassured the certainty of salvation through Jesus to Joseph, who was betrothed to Mary. Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, right? God saves, for he will save his people from their sins. So this was done. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And then Joseph, being aroused from his sweet sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. And he did not know her, that is intimately, until she had brought forth her first child, uh, her firstborn son, and he called his name, in Hebrew, Yeshua, Jesus, God saves. Let's continue reading in Psalm 69, verse 2. Well, let's start again in verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I seek in deep mire, where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters, where the floods overflow me. Deep waters and floods are overwhelming me. Matthew 14, verses 22 through 32. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. 
And later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why do you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Or what about Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 6? So they took Jeremiah and they cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the cistern there was no water, but mire. So Jeremiah sank in the mire. What is mire? Well, it's just mud. It's muck. Not long ago, I was out walking through a creek behind my house, and I had on these big, you know, knee-height rubber boots. But then I got myself stuck into some mud, and I didn't even know if I could get out of it. David is saying, not only am I, am I uh, drowning, but my feet are in the mire. It's drowning, and I'm stuck down in this mud as the water is coming up to my neck. Psalm 69, <clears throat> verse 3, he says, I am weary with my crying, my throat is dry, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. I wait for my God. It's interesting how you can be crying out that the Lord would save you now, and at the same time waiting for the Lord's salvation. You know, the goal of trials, which the Lord ordains, is your perfecting and your completion. God's goal is not to punish us through trials. He uses trials to refine us. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, a familiar passage for a lot of Christians. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let's continue reading in Psalm 69, verse 5. <clears throat> well, let's start with verse 4. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head, and they are mighty who would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. You know my foolishness, and you know my sins. Lord, I'm drowning. Save me. The water's coming up. I'm stuck in the mire. But Lord, I'm waiting on you. You know my sins. Evil men are pursuing me, but you know that I'm also a sinner. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You understand, it's really hard to call the Lord to go over there and judge those sinners over there for what they're doing to me if you yourself have sin in your life. And God's like, well, I'm holy and I don't like sin to be in my presence. So how about I judge you and your sin on my way to go judge them and their sin? Thank you for pointing out their sin, but first I want to deal with yours. David's like, hey, Lord, I'm being oppressed unjustly. They, can, they call me a sinner. They say I've done things that I haven't done. You know that I'm a sinner, but I haven't done the things that they say that I've done. But Lord, I want to go ahead and just confess my sin now. 
<clears throat> Otherwise, it'd be kind of hypocritical, wouldn't it be, for one sinner to call out the sin in another person? It's like the lady who said, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> she says to her husband, you know, I saw the pastor's wife in a cigar store. And, and, the, and the guy says, well, you should tell the pastor. And she says, well, I can't. And she says, why? he says, why not? She says, because I was in the cigar store when she walked in. <laughs> Don't let those who wait for you be ashamed, is what he says in verse 6. He says, let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. Lord, don't let me be the stumbling stone. Don't let those who wait for you be ashamed because of me. You know, most of us, and myself included, hold probably to more prosperity gospel than perhaps we want to admit. We tend to think that <clears throat> following the Lord leads to earthly and worldly abundance, and that we will be spared from suffering just because of our faithfulness to God. And therefore, whenever God-led hardship befalls us, a trial, in order to build our faith, if we only see the blessing of God as getting more worldly stuff, well, then we're going to have a problem whenever God-led hardship befalls us because then we tend to get doubly discouraged. Number one, we personally suffer. Even though we're following the Lord as He has directed us, that can be discouraging. Number two, we suffer shame from other Christians who judge our hardship as if we're being rebuked for having sinned against the Lord. Why else would these circumstances befall us? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 18. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul's like, hey, I'm suffering, but I'm not suffering because God's against me. I'm suffering because God's for me. Now, how many people have put that truth into their operational faith, how they live out their faith in the world? Hey, you know what? I may be suffering because God is approving of me. I love them so much, I'm going to throw suffering into their life. <clears throat> this is nothing new. This is something Paul had to tell to his protege. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and calls us to a holy calling. And part of that calling includes suffering, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he has given us in Jesus Christ before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. You might be ashamed of me, but Paul says, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you, the Holy Spirit. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service that he rendered at Ephesus. You know, even David knew that he was a sinner and needed to confess his sin to the Lord. But once he confessed his sin to God, right, once we do that, we have to just let go of the past. And the devil always wants to dig up the past, which God has buried. And when we confessed our sin, and it's all over and done with in the eyes of the Lord, Satan's goal is to dig it all back up, to convince us that God is powerless that he is graceless, that he is merciless to save us. And of course, that's all a lie. So the next time that Satan tries to remind you of your past, 
How about reminding him of his future? Psalm 69, verse 6, once again, Let not those who wait for the Lord, who wait for you, O Lord, God of hosts, let them not be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. They see me suffering and they go, man, I don't think that David's living rightly. Because of your sake, I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. Because of your sake, shame has covered my face. It's interesting. Shame has covered my face. You know, there will be a time when David's sin against the Lord through adultery with Bathsheba and to the murder of her husband Uriah will lead to God's just punishment upon David's sin. And that will lead the people uh, in his kingdom to despise him legitimately because of his sin, rightly so. But on the occasion of Psalm 69, it is his zeal for the Lord that David's adversaries hate him for. And it is the moment in the psalm where the imagery becomes more clearly messianic, uh, where we begin to understand that the Holy Spirit is using David's circumstances to speak into the future, to the son of David, Jesus. And throughout the rest of the psalm, we earnest, uh, earnestly, easily spot the messianic nuances. We compare David and Jesus' suffering. We also contrast Jesus' grace and mercy with David's call for God's judgment upon his enemies. And in the end, we understand how in Jesus we have a greater than David. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, the substitute of our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Or what about Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, just like the people that are looking at David at that moment. That he's writing Psalm 69. He's bearing their griefs. He's carrying the word of God. He's being righteous and an example, and yet he's being stricken and smitten. They, they say, well, obviously this is the Lord doing this. Now, speaking back of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah, looking forward into the future, he says, we, we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The, chastise, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We look at him and we thought he was stricken, but he was only being stricken because of what we had done. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 24. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults that you take it patiently? But when you do good and you suffer, if you take it patiently, it is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him, to God, who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on that tree, that we having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Oftentimes people think, well, Jesus must have done something wrong in order to undergo that punishment. No, it wasn't Jesus that did something wrong, and we're judging him. It was us that did something wrong, and he took our judgment upon himself. David is suffering un justly. That's why I said at the beginning, I'd much rather have as my advocate uh, the son of David than King David. <clears throat> Psalm 69 verse 8 continues like this. Uh, he says, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. A stranger and an alien, not an alien from outer space, <clears throat> but an, an alien meaning I'm 
They don't even consider me a brother. They think I'm a foreigner. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, doesn't mean that every Jewish person rejected him, <clears throat> but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those that believe on his name. Let's continue in Psalm 69, verse 9. He says, Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. You know, the reason why I'm suffering this is not as much that they hate me, but because they hate you. We tell people when they share the gospel, you know, when somebody rejects the gospel as you shared it to them, <clears throat> it's not as much that, they're, that they hate you as much as they hate who you represent, who is speaking through you straight into their hearts. David understood that. The re the re he's suffering the reproaches of people who reproach God. When people say that they hate Christians or they come up with all kinds of crazy, you know, you're a Christian nationalist, you're a bigot, you're a homophobe, or whatever these things that they say, <clears throat> it's not that they hate you as much, it's the fact that they hate God who lives inside of you in whom you are allowing to speak through you. You're following the counsel of the Word of God, and they follow the counsel of the wicked. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the Bible. And in his law he meditates day and night, while Jesus' zeal for the Lord distinguished him from the religious leaders. This led to his reproach and ultimately to our salvation. Likewise, our zeal for the Lord will lead us to a visible distinction between our lives and between uh, those, sometimes even within the church, who do not pursue the Word of God. And as was the case with Jesus, our distinction will attract some Christians and non-believers to a deeper pursuit of the Lord. And still other people, because of our devotion to the Lord, even within the church, will see that distinction as weird, as arrogant, as judgmental, too sterile in your uh, perspective on life, or maybe you're just too narrow-minded. And that distinction often leads to conflict, which ranges from a low-grade smoldering envy to a full-on persecution. Psalm 69, <clears throat> verse 10, continues like this, When I wept, and uh, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, disciplined my soul with fasting, I'm weeping and fasting, that became my reproach. When I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as a believer, they hated that. I also made sackcloth my garment, and I became a byword to them. And those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of of the drunkards. Those who sit in the gate speak against me. <clears throat> See also Job's friends. You know, the gatekeepers are interesting. They're the ones who say what can come in and what can come out of the church, right? Let's just use Jerusalem as a, you know, as a symbol of the church at large. And there should be watchmen on the walls. They see things coming from a distance, and they know the word. And when they see anomalies to the way things should be happening in the distance, coming from the future, they warn the people of far-off trouble. But the gatekeepers, <clears throat> they have to be more like metal detectors. They have to be the guys with the wands who are personally, uh, you know, they're personally seeking out every single person who comes in. They don't see things from a distance. They, they have to be, they have to look at it from a fine tooth comb. Everything's got to be brushed through to make sure that nothing which doesn't honor the Lord comes in. So when the gatekeepers hate men who are righteous, well, that's a big problem. Those who sit in the gate speak against me. You know, Job and his friends used to sit at the gate. So then you see Job's friends, and then you see the things that they allowed, which were bad to come in, 
<clears throat> and then the things which were good, they kept out. And a lot of church gatekeepers are doing the same thing in our generation. Psalm 69, verse 13, but <clears throat> as for me, my prayer is to you. O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Lord, give me an answer and let your answer be, I'm going to save David. Your salvation, we've already talked earlier, Jesus' name in Hebrew, Yeshua, which means salvation of God. Here the Hebrew word is Yeshecha, right? So you have Yeshecha, your salvation, you have Yeshua, which means uh, God's salvation. <clears throat> in essence, it's the same name. It's the same name that David is calling upon. And I, I'm waiting for your mercy and for your Jesus. His Hosanna, save us now, is in Jesus, the Messiah. You understand this? Psalm 69, <clears throat> Psalm 69 uh uh, continuing here in, in verse 13, he says, But as for me, my prayer is to you. Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me <clears throat> in the truth of your uh, uh, salvation, your salvation, in the truth of Jesus, in essence. Verse 14, he says, Deliver me out of the mire. Let me uh, not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me. And out of the deep waters, like he's sinking down into an ocean or, or down into a deep well. Verse 15, let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up. And let me, <clears throat> and let not the pit shut off its mouth from me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. Don't deliver me because of my righteousness. I know that I'm a sinner. I confess my sin to you. But deliver me because of of their unrighteousness. Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him, <clears throat> notice it's whoever, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. It doesn't matter how you were born. You have the option to be saved. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him, whether you're Jewish or Gentile. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us. He has taken us, moved us into the kingdom of his son, <clears throat> of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins. Let's continue reading here in Psalm 69, <clears throat> verse 16. He says, Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Your chesed. Um, your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Verse 20, reproach has broken my heart and I am full of heaviness. I look for someone to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. And they also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Gall is sour wine. John 19, verses 20 through 30, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst, and now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine. They put it on hyssop, <clears throat> they put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Let's continue reading here in Psalm 69, verse 
uh, uh, 22, he says, let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap, their table. You know, the faithful believer knows that ultimately their unjust suffering will be rewarded by the Lord. Psalm 23, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. They have a table of wrath. I have a table of communion. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You're honoring me in public. My cup runs over. Let's continue reading in Psalm 69, verse 23. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see. You know, part of the reason that Jesus healed blindness was to restore both spiritual and physical blindness. Restore the sight to those people. Some people can't see physically. He could make them to where they could see. Wow, I've never seen things in my life. I've, these are, this is what a color is. Can you imagine? So that's what, a, that's what a sheep looks like. I've been hearing them my whole life. He restores physical blindness, but he also restores sight to people that are spiritually blind. They've read these passages forever, and they've never seen the truth of Scripture the way that he's teaching it, but now it all makes sense. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 22, declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes, spiritual blindness, and see not, who have ears and they hear not, do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? Who has placed the sand as the boundary of the sea by a perpetual degree that it cannot pass beyond it? Which one of you guys did that? And, and, and though its waves toss to and fro, and yet they cannot prevail, though they roar, and yet they cannot pass over it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Therefore, since... We have this ministry as we have received mercy. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. It's not, and we're speaking openly but people can't see it because they're perishing. They don't want to see it. They've got eyes, but they don't want to see it. Well, why can't they see it? Whose minds Satan has blinded. Who did not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. What is the point being? Well, you know, you're blind, but you can really see, but you, you choose not to hear the word of God. You choose to believe the narrative that Satan has been putting out. Because if you grew up with that narrative, it just feels more like home. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, But their minds were blinded. For until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, speaking of the Torah of Moses, a veil lies on their heart. You know, Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. And yet, if you don't want to believe it, well, then there's a veil over you. I'll tell you right now, God didn't put that veil over your heart. But if you surrender to the gospel, Jesus lifts that veil, and then all of a sudden you can see that it was already there. Hiding in plain sight, as they say. Let's continue reading in Psalm 69, <clears throat> verse 25. He says, let their dwelling place... Uh, well, let's go back to, to verse 23. He says, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your wrath take a hold of them. <clears throat> Uh, and he says, let their dwelling place be desolate, verse 25, and let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones you have struck, and they talk about the grief of those that you have wounded, 
and iniquity to、uh, add iniquity to their iniquity, and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and let them not be counted with. The righteous, he says, pour out your indignation and add iniquity. Let them be blotted out. Here we really see the difference, as I said earlier, and that's the third time. Here's the difference between Jesus and David. David appeals for mercy upon himself, but judgment upon his enemies, and that's a very human way to think of it. That's the way we, most of us would go. Lord, give me mercy and give them judgment. But in contrast, Jesus took judgment. Upon himself, and then graciously offers mercy to his enemies. Luke chapter twenty-three, verse thirty-four. Then Jesus said, "Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do." And they divided his garments, and they cast lots. John chapter three, verse sixteen through eighteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Verse eighteen: He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Matthew chapter five, verses forty-three through forty-eight. You have heard it. That it was said, "Love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, well, then what reward do you get? That's easy to do. He says, "And are not even the tax collectors doing that?" And if you greet only your own people, well, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. You say, "Well, I can't be perfect. That's why I need salvation." Yeah, but you can let the Lord perfect you. How do I do that? Seeking His Word and then living according to His character. If you're a follower of Jesus, well, just do what Jesus did. Psalm sixty-nine, verse twenty-nine, he says, "But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me upon high. Let your salvation." Here's this word again, Yeshua Techa. Again, you're Jesus, which is appropriate because all of this imagery in Psalm sixty-nine is messianic imagery. Yeah, David's talking about his life. But the Lord speaking through him is speaking of the Messiah. It just happens to overlay onto David's particular problem. It points to the Messiah. This whole psalm, how the distinction between how mankind, David, deals with unjust affliction and oppression, how that is different from how Jesus deals with it. Psalm sixty-nine, <clears throat> continuing in.、Uh, Let's just say, starting in verse twenty-nine, he says, "But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, let your Jesus set me upon high. I will praise your、uh, the name of God with a song, and will magnify Him with thanksgiving." Verse thirty-one. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull which has horns and hooves. It'll please the Lord more than. An ox or a bull. Consider this from the Jewish prophet Micah, chapter six, verses six through eight. Micah six, beginning in verse six. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Isaiah chapter one verses eleven through twenty. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says the Lord. 
I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths and the calling of assemblies. I can't endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. I don't want sin coming into my church. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates those things. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. uh, Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And then he says, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's continue reading in Psalm 69. Uh, Verse 31, he says, This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull which has horns and hooves. Verse 32, he says, The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your hearts shall live. Seek the Lord, and your hearts shall live. Jeremiah 29, verse 13, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me, with all your heart. You're not reserving anything else behind. I'll follow the Lord up to this point. Well, then you haven't found the Lord. But when you empty yourself of all other ambitions, of all worldliness, then you'll find him. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. There's nothing in the Old Testament that's not affirmed in the New. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and he who knocks, it will be opened. Let's continue reading in in, uh, Psalm 69, uh, verse 33. He says, For the Lord hears the poor, and he does not despise the prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him the seas, and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. Verse 36, Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it. Those who love his name shall dwell in it. The descendants of his servants shall inherit Jerusalem. Consider this in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Now I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea, meaning the symbol of judgment. And then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, a tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write these words, for they are faithful and they are true. You know, only heirs get to inherit the kingdom, the children of the king. You say, well, man, how, how would I become a child of God? How would I? I thought we were all children of God just because we're born. Isn't that true? No, it's a nice thing to say, but it's actually not accurate. 
That's not how you become a child of God, just simply by being born. That's how you become a child of your parents. That's how you become a child of humanity. But only heirs get to inherit the kingdom, only the children of the king. Well, then how do I become a child of God? John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many as received him. Remember those who are searching for him and seeking for him? And he says, and then I'll, I will show myself to them if they seek me with their whole heart. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. What does it mean to receive him? To those who believe in his name. We've said his name over and over again. God saves. He is the salvation of God. There is no other salvation. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. But everyone who comes through him is is brought into the kingdom as co-heirs, as children of God. But you can't receive him without believing in him. The belief does all of the heavy lifting because the focus of that belief is on Jesus. Do you want to experience the salvation, the Yeshua of God? Well, you could be forgiven, washed from within. You could become operating with the power of God's presence in your life, the Holy Spirit in your life. It's all yours if you want it. And I could lead you in a prayer where you could talk to God yourself. You can confess your sin. You can profess your faith and belief in Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sin, that he rose from the grave, that he's alive today, offering salvation. If you would turn from your sin to believe and to receive it, you can know for certain that you'll go to heaven when you die, that the Holy Spirit will immediately rush into your life and begin guiding you. It's all yours if you want it. Let's pray. Lord, I believe that Jesus is God made flesh. And I believe that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. And I believe that he rose from the grave, proving that he has defeated sin and death. And I believe that he is alive today, offering salvation to me if I would believe and receive it. So, Lord, I believe. I surrender control of my life to you, Lord. I believe with my whole heart, and now it is an empty heart. Lord, come in and fill it with your presence. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and begin to teach me how to live a life of thankfulness and purpose which you have created for me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'd love to hear from you. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube or some other streaming type channel, um, well, then you can probably comment right there. Hey, I just prayed. Where do I go from here? And we'll reach out to you. Uh, or you can go to our website, groundworksministries.com, and you can leave us a message there, and we'll reach out to you from there as well. For the rest of you guys, hey, I'm Steve Wiggins. And this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. You know, Groundworks Ministries operates entirely through financial donations from faithful people like you. And your giving to Groundworks Ministries transforms lives. Would you consider making a donation to Groundworks Ministries today? Because we need your monthly support now more than ever. Donating is secure and it's easy on our website, groundworksministries.com. Another way to help is to tell people about Groundworks Ministries. You can share these podcasts with friends and family and on your social media. And of course, you can always direct folks to our website, groundworksministries.com.